number of attendees. Mm -hmm. So maybe we get started and people can join. Sure. Okay. If they're ready. Sounds good. All right, Joe and Carolyn and everyone, you might want to mute for a little bit just so we don't get any background noise then. Thank you. Okay, all right. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar, which is hosted by the Psycho-Oncology Cooperative Research Group, or POCOG. My name is Dr. Nicole Rankin. Um, I'm a Senior Research Fellow in Implementation Science in the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney, and also the Director of the Implementation Science Program for Sydney Health Partners. I'd like to welcome the other panel members here today. Um, so firstly, Dr. Donna Milne. Uh, Donna is a cancer nurse by training and researcher at the Peter McCallum Cancer Care Centre in Melbourne. Sorry, no care in there. I've got my C's mixed up. And my other guest is Dr. Heather Shepherd from the University of Sydney. So today we're going to um, really use this opportunity to talk about uh, implementation science and multi-centre psycho-oncology trials. And I'm going to forward my slides. So the webinar uh, today is the launch of POCOG's new INSPIRE group, which as you can see there stands for Implementation Science Special Interest Group. Um, it's designed for clinicians and researchers to join. And myself and Carolyn Mazarigo from Cancer Council New South Wales are going to jointly chair the group. And we're really keen to get new members on board. So you can see on your screen there that um, you can join via the POCOG email address. Uh, and thanks to Bonnie's great skills. As of today, we also have now a Inspire tab on POCOG's website. So you can go into the POCOG website and see the link to the group there uh, and join up if you're a member of POCOG. And presumably, if you're not a member of POCOG, by the end of the webinar, you'll be absolutely dying to join. Okay, so our program for today, I'm just going to start by giving a welcome and an acknowledge, acknowledgement of country and give a little bit of background. Then we're going to have uh, a presentation on pragmatic trials, which will be nice and brief. Donna's going to talk to us a little bit about some practice-led research that um, is taking place at Peter Mac. And Heather's going to talk to us about the ADAPT trial, which is a large-scale research-led uh, initiative that POCOG has been running over the last five years. At the end of the session, we'll have a Q&A session, and we'd really like you to use the Q&A function um, on your slides, uh, sorry, on your screen. So you can see that there's both uh, the Q&A button and you may still have a chat button. Uh, just to let you know in terms of housekeeping, if you use the chat function, um, all of that information will be recorded because the webinar today is being recorded. So we would discourage you from um, having online chats with other participants um, if you could just hold off from doing that. Um, so we. You know, it won't go into the transcript, um, but please do use that Q&A function. And towards the end of the session, Carolyn will moderate that chat, uh, sorry, the Q&A uh, discussion, uh, and we'll be able to take some questions from you. Okay, so uh, just to begin with then, I'd like to um, acknowledge and pay my respects to the traditional owners of the land on which we meet the Gadigal people of Eora Nation. Uh, and it is upon their ancestral lands that the University of Sydney is built. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land for your current locations. And that includes the Dharawal people um, here in my locality. So I acknowledge the elders past, present and those emerging. And also wish to welcome any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are part of the webinar today. Uh, and thank you for being part of our session. Okay. So, why would we need a group like INSPIRE to focus on implementation science in psycho-oncology? 
some of you may have seen this slide before, or certainly the cartoon in it, just in terms of uh, the gap between evidence and practice. And I think it's fairly widely acknowledged now that um, for implement, uh, implementation is essentially the next big challenge for psycho-oncology. So while we have many great interventions, we have a great wealth of knowledge. Uh, we know that a lot of that isn't moving into the hands of our practitioners and policy makers. Um, there's too many barriers to accessing evidence about what is best care. And we find that all too often practitioners are left to devise their own strategies in terms of uh, offering interventions. So the result of this, of course, is that patients miss out on quality of care. So through these sorts of initiatives like INSPIRE, we're hoping that we can increase the impact of effective interventions, uh, encourage people to use their health funding money wisely and to think about what interventions we need to invest in. We want to, of course, also be able to scale up effective clinical practices and use those interventions that have a really robust evidence base in psycho-oncology research to uh, deliver good care to uh, our patients and to really understand more about the complex health sy systems in which uh, interventions or pro health programs are implemented. So that's just a little bit of a rationale. When we think about the starting points of psycho-oncology research, um, this is a nice slide that just perhaps captures where many of us are either in terms of being behavioural, uh, behavioural researchers who are developing interventions, where we generate new evidence-based programs, protocols, interventions and knowledge. Uh, but many of us are also obviously practitioners who are working in practices where we need to have access to those great interventions uh, and to actually show that practice can generate and uh, indeed lead its own uh, initiatives in research which Don is going to talk about today. And in the middle of those two different starting points, we have implementation science, which is really, I guess, a study about um, the strategies that can be used to help implement proven programs and to get that research into practice. So just in terms of what the purpose of INSPIRE is, uh, we, we've proposed that it's to provide a platform for POCOG members to share and collaborate on implementation research and to build capacity across psycho-oncology research and practice by having a focus on pragmatic trials. Um, I think as a group we're quite aware that there's a lot of opportunities currently for people to learn about implementation science but we're really quite keen to focus that in on uh, pragmatic trials and thinking about how we can upscale initiatives um, across different clinics, hospital settings. Um, indeed, with POCOG being a, uh, one of 13 trial groups, we know that the need to actually have uh, good structures in place for conducting trials is, is needed. So that's part of what we're proposing today. We are, of course, by all means, happy to take on people's feedback. And if there are other things that this group can fulfill, please um, get in touch with us and use that Q&A function today to make suggestions about what you would like to see as part of uh, INSPIRE's work program. Uh, okay, so I've kind of covered this slide in terms of saying INSPIRE then is an opportunity uh, to have a special interest group to meet the needs of members. Uh, and we, of course, want to attract clinicians and researchers a lot in, um, alike. And um, we'd like to try and strive to have a balance of topics that focus both on the methods of implementation science and psycho-oncology content. Okay, so that's a little bit of background. Carolyn's going to keep her eye on the chat and let me know if there are any questions coming through. Uh, but without further ado then, I'll just uh, give you a little introduction into multi-centre pragmatic trials. Okay. So just to begin with, I wanted to let you know that uh, recently, 
several authors from the POCOG group, including Heather and Joanne Shaw, Phyllis Buto, uh, and Tom Hack, who many of you will know, is an internationally recognised psycho-oncology researcher who works in implementation, and Professor Anne Sales, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Implementation Science Communications Journal, uh, and Anna Ugaldi from uh, uh, Deakin University in Victoria, we uh, published this paper, which gives you a, a primer, or primer, depending on which country you come from, uh, about um, the evidence base for psycho-oncology and how that relates to implementation science. It's freely open uh, access, so you can down, download this from the Journal of Psychosocial Oncology Research and Practice, the new journal of IPOS, uh, and it covers the basics of implementation science, including what all the core components are, uh, it covers implementation strategies and outcomes, and it also goes into a bit of discussion about how we can try and maximise the opportunities to accelerate implementation of psycho-oncology interventions. And if you want to delve into uh, the implementation side of things more, I'd encourage you to have a look at this because we won't cover the basics today. Okay. Um, I will cover the basics though in terms of saying where we're really located and thinking about this program of work for INSPIRE is uh, in the implementation practice and research part of this translational uh, pipeline that you see on the screen. So we're very interested in how you think about making a program work. You can see at the bottom of the red uh, circle there, effectiveness studies come into this um, in terms of thinking about pragmatic trials because there does tend to be a bit of crossover between asking, does a program work and how do we make a program work? But essentially anything within this scope uh, of, of implementation research could be fair game for being included as part of a pragmatic trial design. I think it's fairly um, safe to say that um, most randomised control trials in psycho-oncology are what you see here on the screen as explanatory trials. So down at the bottom of the diagram there from figure one, you can see most explanatory trials focus on testing the efficacy of an intervention or a program. And that's typically done under tightly controlled conditions. Usually uh, involves having a fairly small sample size of very um, rigidly controlled inclusion criteria where your patient population uh, needs to meet certain characteristics. And of course, you all be very familiar with the idea of an explanatory trial through drug trials, but obviously in a psycho-oncology setting, this might be a very tightly controlled patient group where you're looking at um, people in terms of only focusing on a tumour type. So it might be just in uh, colorectal cancer or lung cancer, or it might be tightly controlled in terms of people's uh, treatment regime that they're undergoing, or indeed um, if they have clinically um, indicated signs of uh, anxiety or depression. Pragmatic trials, on the, on the other hand, uh, really seek to engage um, people or participants at the individual level, the team level, or the organisational level. So these are the pragmatic trials that really ask about, does an intervention work? How do we make it work? Uh, and the emphasis is on what we would call external validity. So seeing how the intervention operates in a real world setting. I'm going to focus most of my attention for the next little bit, just on this one particular slide, because I think it gives you a really nice overview of the different types of designs that are common uh, within that pragmatic trial um, umbrella. Okay, <clears throat> so what do pragmatic trials actually seek to do? Actually, they seek to compare the effectiveness of interventions in everyday practice with relatively unselected participants and under flexible conditions. So they help us to choose options for care under the usual care conditions 
in which those options might be offered. The key feature of pragmatic trials is a high, an emphasis on high external validity or generalizability. So thinking about wanting to make those, uh, into, uh, to, sorry, to test those interventions with large groups of people or indeed in, uh, with teams or with organizations. So we might be thinking about, for example, um, testing an intervention um, in a setting where all of the participants in that particular clinic would actually be uh, subjected to, or not subjected to, but would receive the intervention. So <clears throat> the main question that we'd be thinking about for a pragmatic trial is, does this intervention actually work in real life? despite the complexity of real world clinical services potentially getting in the way and interfering with uh, that delivery of the intervention. And so for that reason, pragmatic trials are extremely helpful for informing decisions about routine practice. I'm now gonna to switch to hybrid designs, which you can see there on the screen is right front and center. So hybrid designs in implementation science are very popular. Um, and essentially, this is uh, a type of approach where you test both the effectiveness and the implementation of an, an intervention simultaneously. You can see from the slide there that there are three different types of hybrid, hybrid designs. And there are examples in the psycho-oncology literature starting to emerge of, of those types of approaches. So this blended approach basically tries to speed up the idea of testing effectiveness and implementation concurrently, rather than waiting for the effectiveness trial of an intervention to be completed first. Um, there is an upcoming webinar on hybrid designs that the implementation science community of practice uh, is going to be running. And Luke Wolfenden from uh, Newcastle University, who's run a number of these types of trials, is going to go into a lot of detail about the hybrid design. Uh, so that might be something that the psycho-oncology community would be interested in, in hearing more about. <clears throat> okay. The next type of design is the cluster randomised design. And essentially, this is one where the group is randomised rather than the individual. So this might be at the general practice level or a psycho-oncology service within a cancer hospital uh, or a workplace um, where you actually test out the intervention of, um, and see where the behaviour change is. And it's typically focused on the provider or the organisation of care rather than at the patient level. Heather's going to take us through the ADAPT trial, which um, I think you know, will really give us a, a very nice example of, of that cluster randomised design. The other two types of designs which I'll touch on very briefly are the step wedge randomised design, which involves the sequential rollout of an, in, an intervention into the units of randomisation. So with that stepped wedge approach, um, all of the randomised units eventually end up uh, receiving the intervention, but the timing will be different. And the timing is based on uh, a randomised schedule. So again, um, we have an example of step, step wedge cluster designs um, being used in psycho-oncology and some of the work that Afagurgis has been doing here in New South Wales uh, with the prompt care study has been using that type of a design. The final type of design in um, the, the umbrella of pragmatic trial designs is the adaptive trial design. Um, and this is probably the least common in terms of implementation science uh, studies that have been done to date, mainly because they're highly complex. And the um, idea is that you would uh, modify the intervention based on the patient's characteristics and how you accumulate data and how this the time during the design of the study or the, sorry, the conduct of the study. So these methods um, have, I guess, a lot of appeal, but tend to go back to the efficacy questions rather than the effectiveness or the implementation design. 
However, I think we'll see more of these sorts of trials where you actually moderate or change interventions uh, over time as things go forward. So that's really just to give you a bit of an overview of the different types of pragmatic designs from implementation science uh, and how they're being used in the psycho-oncology um, context. There are, of course, many tools available and while we don't have time to go into uh, the detail of these sorts of tools to help people con uh, conduct uh, a pragmatic trial, I thought I'd just mention one, which is the um, pre precise or precise to uh, wheel and this gives you um, a tool or an opportunity to think about the type of design and the questions that you need to ask in a pragmatic trial. Uh, and those sorts of guides are there to help you ask really basic questions about the type of trial that you want to design. So if the uh, Inspire membership were interested in actually um, using some of these tools, we can help you uh, to, to actually get access to them. Um, okay, so that's just a really brief overview from me. I'm going to hand over to Donna in a moment. But uh, you may just want to have a little think and um, contribute to the Q&A at this point in time to think about um, what your interest is in terms of pragmatic designs uh, and whether we focus on um, looking at some of the content around those. Uh, or you may be interested in going back right to the be beginning or the building blocks of designing interventions um, with implementation in mind or anywhere in between. So, Hopefully that's just given you a little bit of information to whet your appetite. And Don is now going to talk to us about starting um, from practice-led research and moving from the clinic and then thinking about going into a potential trial. So thank you, Donna, and over to you. Great. <clears throat> thank you very much, Nicole, and welcome everybody who's online. I have to say it's quite odd sitting in an office by yourself talking to your computer but knowing that, that people are out there. And apologies if you noticed, uh, I had to quickly change rooms just before while Nicole was speaking, thinking I was in an empty office and was just uh, unceremoniously kicked out. So excuse me for uh, if, if you happen to see that. Uh, anyway, hopefully we'll get through this unscathed. So um, my primary role here at Peter Mac is as a clinician. So I'm a nurse consultant in the melanoma and skin service here at Peter Mac, and I've been doing that role um, for quite some time. Currently, I'm doing it full time, um, whereas prior to November last year, I was actually had a joint role where I was doing uh, clinical work as a nurse consultant and also some nurse led research in the Department of Cancer Experiences Research. But what I want to, we can go to the next one, Nicole, thank you. Um, what I want to talk to you today about is, um, sorry, Nicole, are, we, are you able to shift that for me? Sorry, Donna, my screen's about to freeze. Let, give me a second. Sure. Oh, there. <laughs> Great, thank you. So what I wanted to talk to you about um, today is a project that we worked on that stemmed directly from clinical practice. So many of you will be aware of the um, uh, exponential increase in the use of immunotherapies um, in cancer care, and particularly at the moment in the management of people with melanoma. And I feel quite fortunate that I've been working in this environment over the last 10 or so years because I started right at the beginning of the introduction of immunotherapy into clinical practice and have sort of seen that progression over the years from single agent ipilimumab to combination um, ipilimumab and nivolumab and other agents coming on board that's made a huge difference to the outcomes for our patient population starting off primarily in the metastatic setting, but now we're seeing that improvement, improved survival in patients with earlier stage disease who are re receiving immunotherapy in the adjuvant setting. So it really has been quite a remarkable time to be um, working in this field. And for those of you that may know Professor Grant MacArthur, he uh, described it early on in the piece as being like a penicillin moment in medicine. And um, it really feels like we've been privileged to be in this space. 
But of course, not unexpectedly with these newer treatments, we're seeing a very varied and different range of toxicities being experienced by our patients. Some of them can be very mild to moderate and, very, and hardly bothersome. Others can be very severe and perhaps even life-threatening. And the key to preventing those toxicities from becoming severe or life-threatening is the patient and their carers. And it's about them knowing what to report and when to report it. Um, and we were very well aware of that at the beginning, but um, over time that's, we've become even more uh, aware of how important that really is. We had an, a, one approach to education and that was a verbal explanation. It might have been repeated multiple times by the doctor, by, the, by us as uh, nurse consultants, or by um, the staff in the day therapies where they were providing the immunotherapy to patients. Next one, thanks. You're right with the next one, Nicole? Yep. Yep, it's just delayed. Oh, it's so, is it? I'm sorry. So, oh no, we're still there. Hopefully it will flick over shortly. But I guess what we realised very quickly, oh, now I've lost the screen altogether. Okay, so I just need to go back one. Okay, sorry, I beg your pardon, sorry. Yep, yep. So what we realised, sorry everybody, it's um, a bit hard when you don't have control, control yourself. Um, what we um, realised that patients, over time in our interactions with patients, was that patients were not relating the symptoms they were experiencing to the treat treatment that they were receiving. And as a consequence, were not reporting um, issues in a timely manner. We found that we were then having to admit a number of patients for management of toxicities, more so than what we were anticipating. And often they were quite sick um, when they were admitted. So that made us start thinking about what we could do differently. Um, how could we try and get that message across when we felt like we were doing a pretty good job, but clearly we weren't. So we did a total of 35 interviews with um, patients, their family members and their clinicians to try and better understand what was going on for these people and where that gap was in, in our practice. And it was, I've obviously had to summarize this considerably, but things, uh, diarrhoea is one of the key issues that can be experienced by people with um, on immunotherapy. And if it's not treated quickly, you know, we are very concerned about colitis and that can become um, very significant and serious very quickly. But we were hearing things from patients like, oh, I had a spicy Thai meal last night. That's why I had diarrhoea. And clearly that wasn't the case, but that was, that was a common theme that, um, that people were expressing to us, that they could uh, attribute any symptoms that they were experiencing to something they'd eaten or something else that they'd done. And when we sort of started questioning them about, do you think it could be related to your treatment? There was no connection in a lot of people's minds between their treatment and um, the symptoms. We also clearly identified the issues identified by the carers or the family members, the burden they felt around identifying and reporting symptoms. And they were actually feeling quite overwhelmed um, by that uh, responsibility and they had multiple concerns. Thanks. So we applied for some funding from the Cancer Nurses Society of Australia and from MSD. And we were able to carry out, um, a, do a co-design methodology, which res resulted in the development of a suite of videos for our patients um, and their family members. We did carry out, um, held some workshops to identify the key issues. And I've just, we included 16 participants there. And that included patients, carers, nursing colleagues from other hospitals, as well as medical staff. We then did some filming and that was an experience in itself. Um, and I've decided that if I, when I give up nursing, I think I could quite happily go into film production because it's interesting and varied, but you have to be very patient. We then went through several stages of editing, review, ed reviewing um, footage, editing again, reviewing again. And the hardest thing was 
agreeing on what sort of footage we would cut out and not include in the video videos because I think we ended up with something like eight hours worth of footage that we then needed to condense down into videos um, that people were willing to watch. Thanks. So we ended up with a suite of five videos um, under the umbrella of a title Immunotherapy What to Expect and this was all all these um, the topics and the the titles and what was um, included, what is included in the videos very much came um, from the patients and the family members. So our end users were key in um, deciding on the content. But we talked about what we need, what you need to know about immunotherapy, preparing, some on side effects. And interestingly, we were thinking as clinicians that the, there would be a big emphasis on side effects, but that's probably the shortest um, video out of the series um, it covers all the key things um, and there's a couple of nurses speaking in that one but the bulk of it is talking patients talking about what they went through there's also another one on immunotherapy and lifestyle as well as seeking support and immunotherapy and I think one of the key things we picked, we decided early on was that we didn't want to make these videos um, Peter Mac branded or Peter Mac specific nor were they melanoma specific. And that was in recognition of the fact that, yes, we may have had a fair bit of experience in immunotherapy at this point, but that the agents are being used much more broadly now. So we also included patients and carers who were being treated um, with immunotherapy for lung cancer, for example. Top, their issues were very similar, um, but we just wanted to make sure that people felt that they could relate to it um, no matter what their disease was. We've made them freely available on YouTube. And this is just a picture of a card, um, a postcard that we give out in clinic um, to patients and their family members that are about to start immunotherapy so that they know about the videos and they know where to look for them. Thanks. And that's just the uh, a, a screenshot of the front, um, you know, the beginning of the, each of the videos. And they're just a sample of some of the patients and carers that um, spoke in the videos. So in terms of implementation in its loosest sense, I guess, we had the postcards that I showed you. And then we approached a number of um, relevant organisations uh, like the Cancer Council, Cancer uh, CNSA, Peter Mac, and even um, we were approached by a patient organisation in New Zealand asking, and we asked and they asked if they could put links to the videos onto their websites so that if people were looking for any sort of information about um, immunotherapy, then they would come across our videos. But when it comes to evaluation, what do we do? We haven't done anything. I've got anecdotal feedback um, about the benefits of the videos. And I think one stuck out in my mind, particularly um, where a clinician here at Peter Mac let me know that she'd um, seen a patient um, who had poor literacy and poor health literacy. And we felt as clinicians, it was really important that he have, had treatment, but he could not get his head around the concept of what that would involve and what immunotherapy was. So he went away to have a think about it and talk about it with his family. We gave him the details of the videos and within two days, he'd got back in touch with us and said, now I understand what this is all about. And yes, I will go ahead and have this treatment. And he was very open with us and it's saying that he's, um, he'd had to leave school early. His reading ability was very poor. His comprehension was, it was not great. And he always relied on family members to, to um, raise, uh, to sort of inform him about things. And they were struggling to do that as well. So that sort of feedback was reassuring. And it, um, you know, it sort of made us feel like we that was great. I think we've done the right thing. But in terms of any other formal evaluation or assessment of the impact of these videos, we haven't done anything. So thank you. Terrific. Thank you, Donna. And it sounds like there's all sorts of opportunities there to um, think about designing a large scale trial to look at how those sorts of video resources for people uh, might be rolled out across different centres. So again, how we make this program work in, in a broader context. 
Yes, thank you. And I, I think it's interesting because sometimes as working as uh, uh, clinicians, I think sometimes we get a, impatient and want things out there and used by the, patient, by the patients and available to them. So, you know, um, that was our prime aim at the time. But looking back now, I probably would have done it a little bit differently. Okay, so make sure you send through any questions that you have on the Q&A uh, chat for Donna. And before we go to that, I would like to hand over to Heather Shepherd. Heather is a Senior Research Fellow and the ADAPT Program Manager at POCOG and also an Academic Fellow and Lecturer in the Susan Wakel School of Nursing and um, which is part of the Faculty of Medicine and Health at the University of Sydney. So Heather's going to talk to us about the ADAPT trial. Thank you, Heather. Okay, thanks everybody and welcome everybody to today's webinar. Oh, you can go back a slide quick, go back a slide. <laughs> Don't steal my thunder yet, Nicole. Um, <laughs> Um, yes, so thanks. So unlike Donna, I've chosen to come to you from a beach in North Norfolk, so I won't be chucked off this because it is in fact virtual. Um, but yes, today I just wanted to talk to you a little bit about the ADAPT program, which many of you may have heard about, and obviously is one of the, a large program of work which is um, led by POCOG and is funded by the Cancer Institute New South Wales. And um, this is a five-year program of work, and I guess before I go on to talk to you about the cluster randomised controlled trial, which is what the I guess we want to focus on. What I wanted to just remind everybody is that there was a lot of work and a lot of other studies in this program work that led us into the, to the randomized controlled trial, which has an implementation focus. So in the first few years, we did some studies looking at developing health professional training. We did a study looking at and developing patient resources and patient information, as well as in developing up some online therapy called I Can Adapt. I can adapt, which is available um, for patients as within the program, looking at managing their anxiety and depression in an online format. And we also had done some work around looking at barriers and facilitators to implementing the clinical pathway for anxiety and depression. So Nicole, go on to the next slide. So thanks, Nicole. So this slide here really shows you the um, ADAPT cluster randomized control trial, which is the main focus um, or really of our implementation trial. So whilst our whole program of work is re has really been focused on implementation, we've done those early studies to really prepare ourselves for this implementation focused study. And I guess one of the um, things in this study is that um, we had we'd, they already established that screening. So this study is about implementing the clinical pathway for anxiety and depression in cancer care. Okay, and this is available on the POCOG website, and I'm not gonna go into the details of that, but obviously I encourage you all to look at that if you're not already aware of that. Um, but what we wanted to do in this randomized control trial was look at and answer the question around what are the most effective implementation and what, or what level of implementation support is required by cancer services to put this uh, clinical pathway into practice? So we weren't trying to prove the evidence of the clinical pathway. We're trying to look at the question around implementation support and what's needed. So you can see there, um, you can see on the, in the trial design here, we did a lot of work in, the, in those early studies that I talked about on that barrier and facilitator analysis to know what it was that services and health professionals working in this area felt was really important to support a clinical pathway in practice. And I guess a really key part in this cluster randomized control trial is really thinking about who are the study participants. Often in trials, it's always generally the patients, but actually in this trial, the study participants are the staff, is the cancer service, and the staff, and then the patients are kind of there as well, but they're essentially receiving routine care at their service with the implementation of the pathway being part of that routine care. So in this trial design, we wanted to recruit 12 services. So there are clusters, okay? So we recruited 12 cancer services across New South Wales, and then we had developed a process around how we were gonna support them to implement, implement the pathway. And we uh, had held some engagement meetings that we call, which was our pre-implementation preparation to work with us, work with each of the services to work out how we could make the pathway work in practice for them. And the randomization came midway through that engagement meeting process, which was only revealed to the ADAPT team staff and never revealed to the service, around which of our two implementation strategies, you can see on the left onto the blue and onto the right into the kind of orangey red, we had two suites of implementation strategies to look at. Okay, so once we were, had finished preparing the, the sites to go live using the, using the, the strategies that we did, um, developed, which level of implementation support would be the best one. So that was where our randomization occurred. And so 
I guess just really reiterating that here in a randomized controlled trial about implementation, you might want to really think about who your study participants are. Who are the people you're trying to uh, you know, kind of uh, get data from? And maybe it's both. So we, in our ethics and governance applications, we made sure it was really clear that we had different levels of participants. We had staff participants and we had patient participants and made sure that was really clear. So you can see from the design there, we also thought about how um, and when we wanted to collect data. So we had some baseline staff survey and interviews, um, qualitative interviews. And then at midpoint, we had some, uh, um, you can see then we went live with the ADAPT portal and we had used a number of resources and you may be aware of some of those things. Um, so we had developed an online web portal to operationalize the clinical pathway, which many people focus on the screening, but it's actually about the screening and then the triage and referral to um, evidence-based um, care relevant for anxiety and depression. So all the sites were given this portal to go live and then they used it for 12 months. Midway through that 12 months, we then did another repeat of the staff survey and interviews with appropriate staff. And then at the end of the 12 months, we did some more, so we uh, repeated uh, the survey again and repeated interviews again. So we were really trying to find out what the staff felt about the implementation, how they felt it was going and what they felt had worked okay as well. So we really had a collection of quantitative and qualitative data that we could use throughout this study. And so they were the things that were really gonna help us answer the questions around implementation. Um, Nicole, just go on to the next slide because it will make it a bit clearer now. So when we were designing the study, we wanted to we had to be really clear, and this is one of the challenges around really um, understanding the difference between the intervention components and the implementation strategies. So this was a kind of a real challenge around that. And we so we needed to make sure that we were being really clear in all our communications and how we were thinking about what our intervention components were. So you can see here on that little table, we had the ADAPT portal. We had patient information, we had health professional education hosted by EverQ, and then we had our online therapy programs as our, as our intervention components. We also then had our implementation strategies. So we had awareness campaigns, we had the role of champions, we had education around using the portal, um, and then we had academic detailing and support being offered by the ADAPT team, as well as reporting about activity and uptake of screening and triaging and referral of patients. And the last one there was the technology was the portal itself. So a really important part of this work was really um, clarifying um, how the outcomes that we wanted to do in relation to implementation were being defined and measured and how whether our outcomes were relating to our intervention components or our implementation strategies so we could be really clear in our reporting and in this study we've used the proctor implementation framework to really nut out the uh, our different implementation outcomes so these um, i recommend you have a look at the paper by nola proctor this kind of determines outcomes around feasibility acceptability appropriateness, adoption, fidelity, penetration, sustainability, and costs. And so we needed to be really careful, and we made it a really um, kind of quite a detailed process about determining which of our data related to which of those implementation outcomes. Was it qualitative, was it quantitative, and, which, and how we were defining, what did we consider to be feasible, our definition of feasible for the ADAPT cluster randomized control trial? What did we consider to be our definition of acceptability? and fidelity as in did, did, our, uh, did the strategies stick to what we said they were. Um, and as well, penetration in terms of how much did it spread through to other parts of the service as well. So it's a really important, there's such a large preparation component in cluster in implementation research to really be clear about whether you're talking about intervention effectiveness or implementation effectiveness, because they're not quite the same, but they can get confused. But certainly the implementation, we were really looking at those strategies and the effectiveness around those. Um, next slide, Nicole. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. So, as I said, as part of this work, we um, spent a lot of time thinking about how and what's the best way to, uh, I guess, prepare and um, prepare for, you know comparison of effectiveness of implementation strategies and so we actually did a lot of work around how do you actually define success for implementation so this might be something that might be worth thinking about if for people considering and thinking about doing implementation trials in psycho-oncology in the future so we um, obviously spent a lot of time but we would definitely recommend around 
thinking carefully about selecting the implementation outcomes framework. What are those implementation outcomes that you want to focus on? And what are your research questions and what are your aims and hypotheses around that stuff? And then think about how you might um, define success and how you might um, attribute success in your study. So is it going to be something around the patients? Is it around the staff? Or is it actually about the organisational level? So these are the things that we, in preparing and um, carrying out the ADAPT trial, this is where we're, the things that were really important to us. And then, as I said, being really careful about what the intervention is, just describing the intervention components and the implementation strategies. Are there multiple components? And what are the different strategies you're using? And you know, um, which ones are, are directed at staff? Which ones are directed at patients? Or are you aiming just at patients? Or are you aiming just at staff? So they're the kind of things that we um, looked about. And then the idea of identifying your markers and your measures and your data sources. So really spending time to go, OK, so we're using the portal screening data to determine whether patients actually screen and uptake and um, acceptability in that regard. But are we actually going to ask the patients around how they like screening or are we con interested in more about what the, pain, what the staff felt about introducing and implementing screening within their services? And obviously looking at you know, valid measures and using both qualitative and quantitative data as well. And really as part of that preparation, being able to really clearly list your implementation outcomes so that when you're writing up and um, thinking about um, reporting on your trial, it's really clear that you're talking about implementation and or effectiveness of your, in, or your intervention so that you can really be able to clearly map those things um, to that. So I, I guess they were the things that I really wanted to focus on. I know with the um, with the ADAPT cluster randomised control trial, most of you know it's still ongoing. We have 12 services who have participated. 11 have completed their 12 months of the study. We have had over um, 1,300 patients registered into our ADAPT portal where they complete online screening and um, 1,700 um, screenings have happened with lots of people, um, and the majority of people screening in the low, step one, um, uh, minimal levels of anxiety, depression. But we've had a number of positive screens which have enabled the staff to appropriately triage and refer people on to additional support as well. Most of our data really is focused on the staff um, and so we have collected over or almost 250 interviews from staff at all the services across New South Wales, as well as the surveys at the different time points. And we're hoping to have all of our data in by the end of this year. And obviously this is, you know, you need a large team to do things. So I just wanted to thank the nine staff, um, which includes myself. So I'm thanking myself that have all helped us to run this trial over the last five years. But we're coming to the end and we look forward to being able to present some exciting results around that in the very near future. Thanks. Terrific. Thank you so much, Heather. So we're going to now use the last uh, 15 minutes to <coughs> have some time for question and answers. Um, and if when you send through your questions on the Q&A, just if you want to direct it to someone in particular, please just say question for Donna, question for Nicole, question for Heather, uh, and Carolyn's going to um, get us underway. So thanks, Carolyn. Yep, thanks everyone and thanks so much for um, sharing your, your research projects. I have a question just to start off for um, Donna. I know you're saying that um, sometimes clinicians just, you know, see a tool that's really working effectively and they just want to utilize it as quickly as possible. I guess, um, in, you know, from an implementation science perspective, like we want to capture you know how that's being utilized how it's being implemented so how do you balance i guess between the two when you're designing something uh to measure effectiveness or if you if you plan on doing i know it's being used right now but that's kind of like the hard a hard place to be in i think yeah it, it is a very hard place to be and i think that sort of um reflects my co my final comment where i probably would have done things differently um mm. if i had my time again and it was very much, we identified a clinical need and the, the impetus or the, our, our real driving force was to try and do something about it. So, um, and you know, when you've got something and it's complete and you're happy with it or you're proud of it or whatever it may be, it's really hard not to just give it to people to use. Um, and especially when you've got, you know, you feel like there's such a, a need there for it. And yeah, that's probably not a very good answer, but I guess it's just illustrating the, the fact that our, our real drive was to do something that would help our patients in 
quicker rather than, than later, but it doesn't help in terms of um, their uh, evaluation, implementation, research, etc. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I've just got a question here from the chat. Um, how do you decide on a theoretical framework to use when you're designing uh, an implementation uh, sort of trial? Maybe to Nicole or Heather? Um, Heather, do you want to have a go first? Or shall I, in terms of that? Yeah. Um, I think it's a really good question actually to ask about um, how do you select your framework? And my bottom line would always be to say to people, come back to your research question. What, what is it that you really want to do? Is it uh, a question about evaluating how far your intervention is going to reach out to your uh, participants? You might be wanting to think about an evaluation framework, like the re-aim framework, or in the case of ADAPT, we went for uh, the proctor's uh, implementation outcomes. Or you might be going right back to the beginning and thinking about uh, what's the process that I want to follow for designing, testing, uh, implementing and evaluating my intervention. So it might be something like knowledge to action cycle. I think what's interesting now is that there are examples in the pragmatic trial uh, arena where you actually see how people choose which implementation framework they're going to use and how they operationalize that during the pragmatic trial. So there, um, we, we can make that available to the group. There are some really nice examples using what's called the EPIS framework, um, where you explore, prepare, implement, and then um, sustain over time. So that's what EPIS stands for, explore, prepare, implement, sustain and how you run a trial. So very much what Heather was saying about how you do the exploratory work first up, how you do all of that enormous amount of preparation to enrol um, clusters or uh, organisations or people in a trial, then what happens in the implementation phase and then how do you sustain that over the longer term. So there are those kind of resources out there. Heather, over to you. I don't think I can add anything more to that, Nicole. I think you've answered that really well. So, honestly, I'll just be waffling, so I'll let you go. <laughs> okay. yeah. So I'm just mindful that maybe not everyone who's joining our webinar today has an implementation science background or, or knows a lot about implementation science already. Um, so maybe if one of you could sort of discuss a little bit about um, funding, so uh, in getting funding and, and grants, how you can use implementation science to make your project look more attractive <laughs> and, and get that funding, because I know that funders are more, um, you know, focused around the actual outcomes and um, what impact you're actually going to have, you know, with using their funding. So maybe a little bit of encouragement to, to wrap yourself around implementation as well and consider uh, implementation factors early on when, you, when you're starting a, a project. Oh, well, I mean, I guess, well, I guess all of us here <laughs> could probably comment around that. But I guess, look, obviously implementation is very important. And in all grant applications, they're always asking about your translation into practice. There's always a section on, you know, what's the, uh, I, I can't even think of the headings now, but around that. So I guess um, it would be really important when you're thinking about what it is. And I, I guess that's whether you're, whether, you, whether you're just, uh, doing a project where you're focusing on an intervention or whether you're wanting to do a project where you're focusing on implementation. And the challenge is often is that we're trying to do everything in one thing. And, and, that, and, that, and that's a really big challenge. So I don't, know, I don't know what others think about how feasible it is to do intervention effectiveness and implementation effectiveness all at the same time, because that is a lot of data from a lot of different people because there's a lot of different perspectives that all drive into those things. So I think it's just really important to think about with your research team or with your project team, what is it that you're actually doing? Are you wanting to develop a new intervention? Or if, like in Donna's case, they've got this intervention, okay, so now they're at a point where they're wanting to evaluate it in terms of implementation. But I guess it's kind of like, you can't do everything, but maybe in your grants, you can talk about what you, once you've established its effectiveness, you might go on to do this, or you might be able to collect some preliminary data as you're going through the implementation effectiveness, um, sorry, the intervention effectiveness part of your study around how the staff or how people in practice 
actually value what they value about this and what they don't or what they don't value about this to give you some preliminary piloting data around implementation because the key thing is you know to get those things out there in practice that's what you know donna wants and her team want to make these things available to patients and we don't have to wait 15 years for things to come off the research shelf into practice for patients and for health professionals to make their lives easier that's my two cents Thank you, Heather. If, any, if anyone doesn't have anything else, else to add, I'll ask another question specifically about ADAPT. Um, so in the uh, trial design, you said you had, you know, implementation uh, strategy one and implementation strategy two. And I'm sure obviously they're different in, in some levels, but how can you tell, like when the trial is over, how will you be able to sort of differentiate, well, say, oh, this one was better than that one, or this one worked better? Than, than the other and then will you because <coughs> from my experience it's like against usual care or whatever the usual is so now that there are two variables two separate types of suites of interventions like can you say though can you make those distinctions between both of them yeah so i guess we called them like one and two um but really one of them is kind of well not usual care but one is one set of strategies or level of support from the adapt team and one is a different level so it's very clear to us who is in what and what they got okay so what but our primary outcome is around adherence to the recommendations of the clinical pathway so we're looking at the number of patients that screened the number of patients that were uh, triaged and the number of patients that were referred appropriately in line with their screening result around their level of anxiety and depression. So that's our primary outcome and we'll be able to look at whether patients in services in the implementation strategy suite arm um, were adhered more or whether services adhered more than those in, in, in suite two, if you see what I mean. Yeah. So that, that, that will be how we'll do that in that respect. But we don't know yet what the answer for that will be and that's something. <laughs> We'll uh, let you know in due course. Great. Joe might have some other comments, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, well, unless uh, there's no more questions from the chat. So um, just some thank yous. I think maybe as well, like for future, um, if anyone feels, you know, um, that they're interested in, in joining Inspire, please, by all means, send an email to um, Bonnie and uh, we can we can get you on the membership but also if you have any suggestions I think from what Nicole was saying um, about the direction of the group or what you feel might be the best way to uh, our, our future presentations um, of what we can do then I would definitely send through those suggestions as well if you had anything else to say uh, just to wrap us up Nicole I just wanted to um, add my thank yous Caroline um, and so we do have uh, people's contact details there on the screen uh, but I wanted to particularly thank um, both Bonnie and Carolyn for doing a great job with helping set everything up for today. And a special thanks to Donna and to Heather for being our guest presenters and for sharing some of their experiences and insights, uh, which were really, really helpful. And of course, thanks to Joe Shaw, who's our Executive Director at POCOG for making this happen. So we look forward to uh, getting your input and thoughts into the Inspire um, group and um, thanks for being part of it today. Bye everybody. Thanks Nicole. Thanks Nicole. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks Nicole. Okay.